All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today for um, the Ultrasound Grand Rounds this week. This is actually going to be the, the conclusion week for this academic year. We've had a, a nice long year, and we've had a bunch of great topics that we've gone over all the way from cardiac ultrasound to you know, soft tissue ultrasound to first trimester ultrasound. And now we're going to wrap things up with a little MSK ultrasound. So to that effect, I've invited some of our MSK ultrasound experts here at Metro to the channel or to the, the forum. And we have Dr. Uh, Barnes and Dr. Rainey, who are going to be presenting about MSK ultrasound from their sports med experience. And we're looking forward to seeing what they have to say today for us. So I'll turn it over to them and take it away. Uh, thanks for having us. So I'm Erin Barnes, and Dr. Rainey is also online, and she's going to be helping me give this talk. Um, we are sports medicine physiatrists, so we have a tendency to see patients a little bit after you guys do in the ER, um, but we work pretty, I feel like we see a decent amount of patients that are, you know, either soon after the ER. Um, and so I think that this will be um, a good review for you guys of just about how we use um, MSK ultrasound, both in our practice, as well as um, how it can be utilized for you guys in the ER. We have no disclosures. Um, here are our objectives. We're gonna review a few basic principles of MSK ultrasound, um, review some of the um, normals um, and how they're supposed to look, uh, and then also look at how ultrasound can be utilized in diagnosing acute knee injuries, shoulder dislocations, and tendon injuries. <laughs> So why use ultrasound at all or in the emergency department? Some of the advantages are that it's point of care in real time, it can be dynamic. Um, and so all of those things can allow for quick and um, easy visualization of, you know, the more superficial structures of the body um, that allows you to then make um, decisions about patient care that sometimes do need to be made in a uh, fairly um, expedited manner. Um, there's no radiation exposure. We don't have to get prior off for MRIs. And then there is improved um, patient satisfaction that's been demonstrated by multiple studies out there. This one was a 2014 study um, published in the Journal of Emergency Medicine. Um, but there are others out there that do support that this does improve patient satisfaction as well. Um, some of the disadvantages, it's user dependent. So you're only the ultrasound is only as good as the person who's holding it. And so um, it can be variable depending on your experience and um, background in it. Um, it doesn't always get the best reimbursement, but that being said, it also is cheaper for the healthcare system. So that is actually a good advantage of it. And then there is limited penetration. So there's only so much you're gonna be able to see with the ultrasound and we'll kind of go over why that is. So I don't want to belabor the basics, but it is important to kind of know um, how the ultrasound works. So we're just going to go over a little bit of ultrasound 101. Um, so sound is mechanical en energy. So uh, mo molecules in the fluid medium that vibrate are then po propagated as a wave. And so a wave is a disturbance in a medium traveling through it. Um, the periodic application of pressure will generate more waves. And it's important to know that the frequency is a calculation of the number of waves cycles per second. Ultrasound is a mechanical wave with frequencies over um, 20,000 hertz. Um, medical diagnostic ultrasound is between 2 and 20 megahertz, which is 2 million to 20 million hertz. Um, human hearing, just for reference, is between 20 and 20,000 hertz. And then this is the same um, wavelengths that uh, various animals, as well as sonar, um, are using for echolocation. Um, the question is then, how do we generate these waves? So the probe that we use for the ultrasound is attached to um, the machine. The machine is going to send an electric signal, which is the alternating electric current through the transducer. The transducer contains a row of piezoelectric crystals, which have the ability to convert electrical energy into mechanical energy, which is the sound wave. And this is through actually a reverse piezoelectric effect. Um, when this voltage potential is applied to this array of crystals, they're converting that energy, and then that's going to be transmitted into the adjacent tissue. <laughs> So in the same manner of how that echolocation works, those sound waves are going to bounce off their target medium and then back to the transducer at varying frequencies. These echoes 
um, stimulate the crystals to convert the mechanical energy, so the sound, back to electrical signals, which provides the necessary data to provide the 2D gray scale um, image that we see on the screen. So, you know, that's how, that's essentially the basics of how we're getting from this to this picture, okay? And it's important, you know, just from the baseline to know your anatomy because you're only going to see what's under that probe. And a few other things to consider. Um, so ultrasound cannot transmit through air, um, and that's because of the difference of acoustic impedance. So to maximize the transition of sound between the tissues, the impedance constants, constant needs to be as similar as possible. And as you can see here, the difference between air and soft tissue is pretty significant. And so that's why we use the gel. Um, it's a coupling media um, and it's made of gelatinized water. And this then allows for the transmission of those sound waves um, into soft tissue. So if you've ever tried to put the ultrasound probe on a body and you can't um, see anything, it's be probably because you don't have the gel on yet. Another good concept to review is the pul pulse echo principle. And this essentially allows for us to see depth on the screen. And so this principle describes the time that it takes for an alkaline signal, which is the pulse to return, which is the echo, which then allows the distance to be calculated. And then this is gonna result in different depths of the structures on the screen based on how quickly they return back to the, um, turn back to the transducer. So generally speaking, when you're looking at the ultrasound uh, screen, you're gonna see um, the more superficial structures at the top of the screen, and then the deeper structures at the bottom of the screen. And then another important concept is echogenicity, um, which is the ability to reflect or transmit ultrasound waves in the context of the surrounding tissues. So when those ultrasound waves pass through a tissue, it's gonna appear darker or hypoechoic um, because less of these waves are gonna get back to the transducer. When the ultrasound waves are reflected, it will appear brighter since more of those waves are coming back to the transducer. Um, and this is, influenced by multiple things, but, but primarily I think about it kind of like structure density um, with less dense, dense structures appearing um, darker on the screen and then more dense structures appearing brighter. And so um, anechoic is when you have the absence of echo. So those are gonna appear black and we see that with bone. And that's because bone, um, you're gonna have this bright hyperechoic rim because of how dense it is. All of those sound beams are coming here, reflecting back, and then nothing's penetrating through. So it's gonna appear black behind it with this bright hyperechoic rim because all of these signals are getting back to the transducer. Hyperechoic is bright white, hypoechoic is gonna be darker and gray. And like I said, this is partially a um, metric of density. So blood vessels, muscles, nerves, tendon, ligaments, fascia, bone, increase in echogenicity from darker or hypoechoic to brighter hyperechoic. And then another uh, key concept is um, the relationship between frequency and resolution. So I'm sure you guys are familiar that you're going to have different frequencies of the transducers. And then you can also have um, different frequencies settings that you can adjust on the actual ultrasound machine. And so we talked about frequency um, in that first slide. It's the number of cycles per second. And so with a higher frequency, you're going to see better resolution in grayscale. So that means you're going to have a sharper picture and be able to see more defined structures. Um, and that's because the faster wavelengths allow for more tissue contact and then more tissue detail to be figured out by the machine. Um, this then, like I said, increases your ability to distinguish fine detail, but you're gonna compromise that for lower penetration because it's gonna essentially peter out at some point. It's gonna lose energy. So this is gonna be better for superficial or fine structures, whereas the lower frequency, you're gonna have poorer resolution. So you're not gonna have as good of ability to distinguish between um, structures and have less fine detail, but you're gonna be able to get those wavelengths deeper because they're not gonna lose as much energy going as far um, deep. So like I said, this is better for deep or big structures. Um, and you can see here, this is an example of a hip joint. And on the left side, we're going to have a curvilinear. So we get to see a, because it's a curvilinear probe with less resolution, you're going to see a wider field of view, but you're going to compromise on the detail. And in some people, you know, we are not going to be able to use a linear probe to see their hips, so you're going to have to use the curvilinear. 
and that's just a matter of depth. All right, so just a few key things about optimization. So step one is turn the machine on. Step two is no anatomy. Three, optimize the image. And then four, go forth and be awesome. So um, a few things to start, hands-on optimization. You know, you wanna make sure you're holding the probe correctly. I usually use three fingers on the probe and then the other two fingers um, anchored on the body. You want to be comfortable so usually i'm going to be on one side of the patient have the patient in front of me and then ideally have the um, screen on the other side you don't want to be making your own neck or back sore by doing this um, you want the patient to be comfortable so they need to be in a position where they're not um, twisted like a pretzel either and then don't drop the probe because it has the crystals in it and if they get messed up then it's a lot of money to replace the probe so this is not how to hold a probe, and this is how you should hold the probe. Um, transducer handling, I'm not gonna belabor this, but there is there recently was published a consensus statement on new definitions of how we're um, defining these different movements, and it's good to know for reference. So that way, when we're all communicating to each other, we understand what we're talking about. And then you can um, optimize the machine by pushing the buttons, which is also called knobology, right? So you have depth, frequency, focus, game, and time gain compensation. Usually you wanna adjust the depth, frequency, and focus with each new target structure to best optimize first, and then you can adjust gain and then time gain compensation as needed. But most of these machines are gonna have presets um, based on the body structure. And usually those will kind of set these based on the average um, you know, structure, um, ideals. Oops. So you have the two different types of transducers that also can help you um, optimize your image. And so picking these helps to um, with your frequency as well as the depth. Um, and so the linear array, you're going to have higher resolution, a narrower footprint versus um, the curvilinear array, you have lower resolution, but deeper penetration. And you want to use the highest frequency possible that allows for sufficient depth. Um, so with this, uh, uh, this is just an example of how you can optimize the image. So over here, if this is the area of, uh, you know, that you're looking to uh, evaluate up at the top of the screen, this is going to be too deep. So if you reduce the depth, um, that's how you're going to get to B. And then you have this big focal zone. If you narrow that down, you're going to be able to see the structures within that focal zone better. And then, so here, here you've had it reduced and centered in the area of interest, and then you can increase gain, and that's how you see that area a lot better. And then um, there are um, artifacts that should you should be aware of when you're using the ultrasound. These are image findings that are mis uh, that misrepresent the anatomic structure being examined, and it's a result of assumptions being made by the ultrasound machine. It is inherent to musculoskeletal ultrasound and can lead to false, false pathological calls. So it's good to be aware of. Um, there's a variety of different ones that you should be aware of. The one that I'm gonna just talk about briefly here is anisotropy, because it's probably the one that we see the most of. Um, anisotropy is the property of tissues to vary in their appearance, depending on the angle of the ultrasound beams. Um, this can occur for uh, a couple different reasons. One is because the transducer is not parallel to the structure. Um, the ultrasound beam being three to seven degrees off perpendicular can um, cause anisotropy. And then certain types of tissue are going to be more prone to anisotropy. So tendons are the most prone. And so we see it the most with that, which is um, unfortunate because we actually use it probably the most for calling tendon tears. So not super helpful, but just something to be aware of. So that way you're not overcalling pathology. And essentially what's happening is these beams are um, you know, coming down and then being returned if you're perpendicular. The further from perpendicular that you get, the less of those beams are going to be returned back to the probe. And that's what's being demonstrated here with the incidence angle. And so here's a good example. Um, this is the supraspinatus tendon in the shoulder. Um, and, you know, in figure A, you could potentially be concerned about an insertional uh, or interstitial tear um, where this hypoechoic region is. But, you know, these structures, even though you might be parallel to the structure on top of the shoulder, you might not be parallel to, or sorry, uh, perpendicular to those um, fibers as they're diving deep 
at their insertion. So a heel toe maneuver, which um, you're seeing happen here in B, is then going to allow you to fill in that defect and show that it, those fibers are actually there and not pathological. And so it's always good to get, um, if you are going to call something torn, it's always good to get, you know, views in two orthogonal planes, so short and long axis, and then also, you know, make sure, just be wary of where um, anisotropy is more prone to happen and being cognizant of that. And then the biceps tendon, um, long head biceps tendon at the proximal region is quite prone to this as well. And so in this picture, um, C is usually what you'll see first with this area, this hypochoic region, and you're thinking, you know, is this torn? Is it absent? Um, and then you just do a simple cephalad uh, wag, and then you fill in the area, okay? And then I'm just gonna review a little bit of sonoanatomy. So what is normal? Um, just to review nomenclature, um, long axis um, is going to be, these are um, with the transducer relative to the anatomic alignment of the structure. Long axis is, or is longitudinal, and that's parallel to the structure, where a short axis is transverse and perpendicular. And then a little bit outside of the scope of this lecture, but in plane is referencing um, the needle relative to the transducer. In plane is going to be um, allowing you to see the needle shaft the whole way versus out of plane, you're going to be perpendicular to it, and you're only going to really see a cross section of the needle. So like I kind of talked about before, bone is going to be a bright hyperocoic rim with an anechoic region deep. You can see sometimes posterior acoustic shadowing. Um, and that is another artifact. It's also good to be aware of um, areas that cortical irregularities may not be pathological. So if you see, um, you know, changes in the cortex where it's not smooth and it becomes irregular, um, you know, sometimes that does mean something's wrong with the bone or even the tendon over top of it, especially in the rotator cuff. Um, that being said, there are some areas such as, you know, the posterior region of the shoulder, um, the bare zone, um, even over the medial and posterior facets of the humerus, you know, those areas sometimes have cortical irregularities or even nutrient vessels that may, you know, you may think that that means that there's like a tear in the tendon there, but really it's just, you know, that's normal for those areas. Um, cartilage, um, the hyaline cartilage is going to appear hypoechoic, and so this is ephemeral trochlea, and the hyaline cartilage is the layer over top of the bone. Um, and then fibrocartilage, such as the labrum or the meniscus, is going to appear more hyperechoic, which you can see here with this triangular structure in between the arrowheads in the posterior glenohumeral joint. And it's also important to not mistake hyaline cartilage for an articular sided tear. Um, you can see this here in the you know, posterior shoulder, but then also um, around the rotator cuff in the views like similar to what we saw. Um, back here, um, you'll see um, this area of darkness over top of uh, the bone. And it's not necessarily an articular sided tear. It may just be the uh, hyaline cartilage layer. Um, tendon is going to appear hyperechoic with a fiber-like appearance. In long axis, it's going to be fibrillar, like this patellar tendon in here. And then short axis, it should look like a broom end with this kind of like stipled um, look to it. Nerve um, is going to appear uh, both mixed hypoechoic nerve fascicles surrounded by hyperechoic connective tissue, which is the epineurium. Um, in long axis, it's going to be fascicular, like the median nerve demonstrated here. Um, and then in short axis, it's this honeycomb appearance. Um, it is important, especially in places like the wrist, to distinguish the nerve from the extensor carpi radialis tendon um, or the flexor carpi radialis tendon, since those often will look similarly. Um, and then muscle is going to be relatively hypoechoic, but it is going to have this fine hyperechoic paramecium, which is connective tissue in between the muscle uh, fascicles. And then in the uh, long axis, it's going to be pennate or feather like, whereas in short axis, it's going to be described as a starry sky or starry night appearance. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how we can use, um, you know, this in an emergency department setting. We're going to do a series of cases for you guys, and I'm going to have Dr. Rainey um, start. All right. So we're going to start um, with the knee. 
Um, so you're working in the ER, you've got a 45 year old male that comes in um, and he's got one day, he fell yesterday, uh, kind of on the front of the knee, he's got a painful swollen knee. Um, it's all throughout the knee. He cannot really localize where that pain is. It's pretty sharp in nature and he's not able to put um, pain or put pressure on the leg because it's too painful when he's walking. Um, he's not reporting any sort of uh, locking or instability and has no prior history with this knee, no prior injury or surgery to that knee. So um, there you've got that gentleman with a swollen knee. So what's our differential diagnosis? So um, in your sort of set setting, um, you know, thinking about where the effusion or where the fluid might be is, is helpful. Um, so you kind of work your way back. You might be thinking about some sort of prepatellar bursitis, in this case, most likely traumatic. Um, always think about your ligament tears, uh, PCL, especially with that history of falling on the front of the knee, but, you know, potentially an ACL as well. Meniscus tears, some sort of flare of arthritis or, or gout or pseudo gout. Um, an extensor mechanism injury, whether that's the quad or patellar tendon or the patella itself, and then fracture um, is always on your differential. So then we're going to uh, look at how you would um, look at uh, the fluid and kind of help to kind of narrow down your differential. So um, actually examine the knee and see um, if there is an effusion or if you think it's more soft tissue swelling. Um, you will get patients that come into our clinic, and I'm sure you guys get it in the ER that say, oh, my knee's swollen, but it's not necessarily a joint effusion, it's something else. So um, use your um, physical exam to see, do you feel like there is an actual joint effusion? Um, you can palpate the posterior aspect of the knee and, and see if you kind of feel any fullness back there that may indicate a Baker cyst. Um, Prepatellar bursitis tends to be a little bit more focal towards uh, the area just above the patellar, right on the patella. They're not going to necessarily have an effusion with that. So that's something to kind of help figure out is this a bursitis, a prepatellar bursitis versus an actual knee effusion, or do they just have some general soft tissue swelling? Um, so once you've kind of got your fluid evaluation worked out, one of the first things that I look at, um, particularly with an acute injury like this, is do they have an extensor mechanism injury? So those tend to be very urgent acute issues that often need to head off to one of our orthopedic surgery colleagues and not necessarily come to the non-surgical sport side. So a simple exam uh, maneuver is just, can they raise their, their leg off the table? And if they're unable to keep their knee uh, fully extended and raise that leg off the table, then you do have concern for an extensive, me extensive mechanism injury. And then you use those special tests that we all learned in medical school and residency, your Lachman's maneuver to look at your ACL, um, McMurray's to look at your meniscus and varus valgus stress. So once you've got your exam, you're kind of starting to narrow down your differential, then you can use the ultrasound to um, kind of look at those fluid collections and then help you um, make that diagnosis. So I'm looking at the prepatellar bursa. Um, this is going to be a fluid collection just on the um, anterior aspect of the patella. And one thing to be really careful with this is that you don't want to put too much pressure on the ultrasound probe because then you may be compressing that um, swollen bursa and you may not be seeing it. So you want to put a lot of gel on the top of the knee or on the front of the knee and use really gentle pressure and essentially just float that probe over the patella and see, do you see um, any sort of fluid collection over the patella? So you can see in this picture that hyperechoic line is the surface of the patella. Um, and then that um, hypoechoic kind of football looking structure is your bursa. Um, so it is just superficial to the, that. Um, you can see the patellar tendon there off to um, the right of the screen. So you're just looking for that uh, fluid collection anterior to the patella. Um, if you don't see that and you're looking for knee joint effusion, we'll often um, use the same view to look at a knee joint effusion as we do to where we're actually doing a um, intraarticular injection or aspiration of the knee. So you go just superior to the patella. This is a longitudinal view. So that's the quadriceps tendon that um, uh, the linear structure kind of um, across the middle third of the photo there. Um, and that's the patella off to the far right. And so that hypoechoic area just beneath the quad tendon is your effusion. So um, you, you'll, you should have some idea from your physical exam if you think there is an actual knee joint effusion, but then you can use your ultrasound to confirm if you think that there is um, an effusion there. And you can do it in longitudinal view. Also in transverse view, you'll see it kind of um, popping off, off to the side by the patella there. And then the Baker cyst in the back of the knee. So 
Um, sometimes patients will come in with this posterior discomfort, uh, feeling like a swelling sensation or tightness back there. We usually, the, I always tell patients that a Baker cyst is a sign, sign of something else going on in the knee, whether it's the flare of their arthritis um, or some sort of other trauma. And this is kind of the path of least resistance to the fluid for the fluid to go to. So um, um, where you're going to be looking for it is between the the gastroc and the tendon of your semimembranosa. So um, this is technically a bursa. It's your gastrocnemius semimembranosus bursa. And that's just a mouthful to say. So we call it a baker cyst. So um, this is going to be more on that medial side of the knee. You always want to find your vessels and make sure that um, you know where those are and, and that you're not mistaking a bursa um, for a vessel. And the other thing um, that you need to be concerned about with this is, is making sure you're not having um, anisotropy with those hamstring tendons, particularly the semimembranosus, and thinking that you're seeing a bursa, but you're just, uh, you just have that artifact of the tendon. So rocking that probe back and forth, um, sometimes I can, you can trace the tendon back more proximally into the thigh and then come back down and really make sure you're differentiating between um, the tendon and the baker's cyst. Um, usually when we're seeing these and draining them, they are pretty um, a pretty significant size. If it, if it was quite small, we don't usually um, drain it just because, again, it's not usually the primary source of what's going on. So it should be this anechoic area between that tendon and that gastroc muscle there. Um, Looking at, you know, there was a study back um, that was just published last year looking at um, MRI versus ultrasound with um, for Baker's cyst. And ultrasound is actually excellent. So sensitivity of 0.97, specificity for one um, comparable to MRI. So as Dr. Barnes touched on earlier, this is much cheaper, much faster, pretty re readily available. Um, so you can grab the ultrasound, pop it on the back of the knee and see if you see a Baker's cyst. So, um, much, much cheaper than, than getting an MRI. And so then um, looking at the extensor mechanism. So this is your quad tendon, your patella, and then your uh, patellar tendon. And again, these are, these are more urgent or emergent issues. So um, there's a couple things that you're looking at with both your quad tendon and your patellar tendon. Really, we're looking for major ruptures or tears. So you see that the kind of linear nature of the tendon um, off to the far left and right of the, the screen, and you're looking for disruption of that tendon in between. And sometimes there will be um, significant fluid collection along with that if there's a type of uh, hematoma that's developed. So looking for disruption of that tendon. Again, you should al already have an idea if you're concerned for a full tendon tear based off of your physical exam. And then fracture can also be evaluated. So I think we all, uh, typically think of x-ray uh, for looking at fractures, but ultrasound can be used as well too. Um, so with this, we know that bone, um, you cannot image through bone. So we see this hyperechoic line, um, like you see off to the right, and that's the um, normal looking patella. Um, but anytime you have a fracture, you're gonna see a break in that line or a disruption of that hyperechoic line with potentially fluid collection and hematoma above it. Um, so um, this can be used not just with the patella, but with other um, superficial bones and, and sometimes even some of the deeper bones as well, too, if you have um, deep enough penetration of your ultrasound. So um, there was a study, again, that looked at ultrasound compared to x-ray uh, for looking at knee fracture in the, re in the um, whole knee itself. So it was tibia, uh, patella, uh, femur, and fibula. And so, um, again, comparing x-ray to ultrasound um, sensitivity was... 97%, specificity 85%, positive predictive, predictive value of 78%, and negative predictive value of 98%. 98%. So um, pretty good use there. And again, um, if you've got a patient that um, is just laying there in bed, you can kind of use this as the extension of your physical exam. You're probably still going to end up getting an x-ray anyways, but, but kind of nice to know going into that. So um, the, air, the types of fractures that are most difficult to see would just be a little avulsion fracture or any sort of um, circular type pattern can be um, missed more so on ultrasound compared to x-ray. One downside with x-ray compared to ultrasound with looking at fractures is, you know, you are putting pressure over that area, so you may be limited a little bit by pain, but you can use the ultrasound gel um, to kind of float that probe, try and limit your pressure on it.
And so, you know, we've looked at our fluid, um, or we've looked at our knee, we've kind of got an idea off of our uh, physical exam and where the fluid is, what our differential may be narrowed down to. Um, but getting the fluid out of that knee is, can be very, very helpful in terms of our diagnosis. So um, uh, doing an uh, aspiration of that knee joint and then sending the fluid off um, would be helpful. So um, even just looking at the fluid on ultrasound, you may be able to get an idea of what type of uh, effusion you have. So the acute effusion tends to be very anechoic, so um, just very dark black structure, um, whereas chronic effusion, so if you have somebody with arthritis um, and they've had a uh, fusion that's been there for a while, you'll see more of like a fibrous debris, a little bit of a hy more hyperechoic um, uh, area throughout the knee joint it tends to be kind of um, surrounding the hypoechoic um, or anechoic fluid. So you can get an idea of if this is truly an acute knee issue or if it has been a little bit more chronic. Um, and then use your ultrasound to help with your aspiration. So um, uh, landmark guided or blind aspiration um, is definitely something that we use, but if we can get the ultrasound on, we know that um, that can be uh, very helpful. Um, there is no difference between success, um, blind or um, ultrasound guided, but we tend to be faster um, with ultrasound because you can see where the fluid is, you watch your needle go in. Um, this is an in-plane approach that they're demonstrating and you can see that needle off um, to the far right picture. Um, so you can see it, um, watch the fluid come out, you know when you've gotten it. Um, sometimes we'll um, use our other hand, or if we have somebody helping us, we can. Uh, you can kind of milk the fluid from other parts of the knee to get most of that out. So um, less painful and and faster if you're doing it um, with ultrasound guidance. Um, and then you take this fluid, send it off for crystal cell count and um, and culture. Um, moving on to the shoulder. Um, so we've got a 40 year old male. Um, he was skiing over the weekend and fell on an outstretched arm. Um, he, this just happened about 20 minutes ago. He was popped in the uh, squad and sent off to the ER. Um, he's got pain kind of throughout the shoulder and parasites down into his arm and he's unable to lift that arm. It essentially feels like a dead arm to him. Um, again, no prior injury or surgery to this shoulder. Um, and on an exam, he's got this kind of unusual contour of his shoulder. It looks different than the other side. Um, he's got good distal strength, but um, no active um, abduction or forward flexion of that arm. So differential diagnosis um, of an acute shoulder injury on a, with a fall on outstretched arm, you're thinking about things like rotator cuff tears, um, shoulder dislocations, AC joint sprains, always fracture, and then um, less commonly a brachial plexus injury like a stinger. And so how would you, we use ultrasound to help us kind of break down this differential at, at this point? So um, ultrasound is very, very helpful with shoulder dislocation, dislocations for a couple of reasons. Um, most of the time, as you guys probably already know, um, the vast majority of dislocations are anterior, um, but you can see posterior dislocations. Um, these are most commonly seen in people um, after seizures or electrocutions. Um, as again, you guys know, you wanna get these reduced ASAP. Um, so when we're on the football sideline or at a wrestling meet and we have a dislocation, we immediately try and reduce it. The longer um, you wait, the more difficult it is going to be to reduce these and more likely that they're going to need your assistance with some sedation and then um, reduction at that point. And then as with any um, post-reduction, um, you want imaging. Um, and oftentimes that is x-ray, but um, as I'll show in a little bit, ultrasound can be used for that as well too. So shoulder dislocations, um, there are studies that look and a lot of case reports looking at diagnosing shoulder dislocations that go both anteriorly and posteriorly. So both of them use this scanning technique where the probe is gonna be across the posterior aspect of the shoulder, um, it's gonna be just um, below the spine of the scapula. So a lot of times I will palpate the scapula, um, spine of the scapula, put the probe um, right on it, and then just kind of come down under it and then move your probe laterally out towards where the humeral head should be. Depending on patient body habitus, um, sometimes you can get away with a linear probe if they are pretty thin, um, but a lot of times we will need to use a curved linear probe um, just because they are, just the, because of muscle mass or other soft tissue. And so 
um, what we're going to be looking at is the humeral head in relation to the um, glenoid. So on the left side of the screen, um, you can see the glenoid just kind of an, in the middle, right under where it says scapula. So that's your cup. Um, and then the humeral head is the ball kind of sitting that cup. And you wanna see them in close relation. Essentially, um, should, should be able to draw a straight line across from the humeral head to the glenoid there. In an anterior dislocation, you're gonna see that humeral head displace essentially be much below the scapula. And you'll probably see a joint effusion there um, as demonstrated in that picture. So a hyper hypoechoic area above that hyperechoic um, humeral head. In a posterior dislocation, it's gonna be coming, that humeral head is gonna be coming back um, towards you. So the glenoid is there off to the left, and then we've got the humeral head there on the right side of the ultrasound picture. And so that is coming essentially like back towards you if you think about your orientation of the rotator cuff. Um, with these, you can also, since you're there, if you're gonna be doing an, a, um, a reduction immediately, um, you could use this position to inject some lidocaine in these areas and numb up the area prior to doing your um, reduction. Um, so this is the, um, uh, so once you've reduced the shoulder, you're looking at post-reduction imaging. Again, typically we go towards um, x-ray, but you can use ultrasound with this. And we use the same exact position. So you're looking to see is that humeral head then located again in the glenoid where it should be. Um, benefit of this as opposed to um, x-ray is that you can do this really quickly. So if you're there at the bedside and you do whatever maneuver you choose to do to reduce that shoulder, pop the ultrasound on, see if the glenoid um, and humeral head are in uh, alignment. And if so, fantastic. I would probably send them for an x-ray at that point. If not, um, especially in your setting, if there's sedation, you're hopefully going to be able to catch that before the sedation wears off. And so that you don't have to re-sedate them, you can make a second um, reduction attempt and then check um, the ultrasound uh, to see if that humeral head is in the glenoid. Um, there were, again, there are lots of case reports on this. First one that I saw was back um, in 2009, actually in your American Journal of Emergency Medicine. Um, so then moving on to rotator cuff tears. So not as emergent of an issue in the ER, but I'm sure you guys see it and then, um, and then get sent off, sent off to us. So of the four rotator cuff muscles, the one that is most commonly torn is the supraspinatus. Um, a lot of cases, there's some underlying rotator cuff tendinopathy and then um, can get an acute tear on top of that if it's not a chronic tear. And one of the best physical exam tests to look at is this job or empty can test where you have the arms um, kind of forward flex to 90 degrees, thumbs down, and, um, and have the patient resist. And so um, they'll have quite a bit of weakness with this, um, with that supraspinatus if it's torn. Um, and um, this is a normal picture of a uh, rotator cuff. So you should have the deltoid overlying it. That hyperechoic line is where your bursa is going to be, and there's some fat in there with that tissue. Then your supraspinatus is that um, essentially middle layer and then the hyperechoic area of your humeral head. So you can kind of count your layers down as one way to look for a rotator cuff tear if you, if you think it's there. Um, so when you're looking at the uh, rotator cuff on ultrasound, things to point towards tears, uh, as I touched on before, um, just absence of that muscle. So you know kind of what your anatomy should be and what your layers are deep to that probe and just having an absence of that of that area. If it's a partial tear, um, you may have a hypoechoic area in part of the tendon as the picture to the top right shows. Um, you have to really be careful with anisotropy with this. So um, make sure that you're moving the probe back and forth, rocking it, making sure that area doesn't fill in. So it could just be that you're not um, in perfect alignment and that that hypoechoic area looks um, like, a, like a tear, but it may not necessarily be. Um, you can look for irregularity along the greater tuberosity that would point to some um, tendon tearing. And then other secondary signs of rotator cuff tearing are um, fluid around the biceps tendon, which is what the bottom left um, picture shows, as well as a geyser sign of the AC joint, which is that extra fluid kind of coming up out of the um, AC joint, which is on the bottom right. Those are secondary signs. So if you see those a lot of fluid in those areas, you may want to search harder for a rotator cuff tear. 
And then I'm gonna to touch briefly on AC joint sprains. So I'm sure you guys are familiar with the Rockwood classification of types of AC joint sprains. They're gonna come in, point tenderness at that AC joint. They'll have pain with that scarf test where you bring the arm across the shoulder. And you can use ultrasound to look at this. So um, a lot of times people will get x-rays, they'll look for that step off, um, but you can um, look for a geyser sign again for the AC joint and then do dynamic testing. So sometimes this takes a couple hands, um, but put the ultrasound up on that AC joint, um, do your scarf test and see, do you see um, gapping or widening of that joint with stress testing. And so next I'm gonna be reviewing our third case. Um, this is a case that I saw in my clinic the other week. Um, he had been in the ED the day prior. So he um, is a 36 year old male with a history of diabetes type one, um, presented to the ED after a left ankle injury that day. He had been playing rec basketball and he went to run from a planted foot and felt a pop in the back of his ankle and calf. And he said it felt like a gunshot. He fell immediately, was unable to wait there. And then his exam, you can see here, he has um, some changes on the right side, which is, um, you know, there's more swelling. On a, you could feel a palpable defect along the Achilles tendon. He had plantar flexion weakness, and he did have a, a positive Thompson's test, which is when you are squeezing the calf in order to try to induce plantar flexion, um, testing for an Achilles um, injury. So your differential for this, you know, with this kind of history and exam, you're pretty, I'm sure you're pretty confident that there's some sort of Achilles tendon injury. So that would be an Achilles tendon rupture or a partial Achilles tendon rupture. You can also have um, tears of the gastroc or soleus muscles. You can have a DVT, um, ankle fracture, arthritis, retral calcaneal bursitis. Those are going to be less likely given the mechanism though. Um, so for the posterior and Achilles ultrasound evaluation, um, this uh, here, the distal is on the right side of the screen, proximal is on the left side of the screen. This is a long axis view um, in A, where you are looking at the tendon in between the arrowheads, and it's extending down to insert on the calcaneus. The um, asterisk here actually demonstrates some anisotropy um, as those fibers are diving down to the calcaneus. Deep to the tendon is going to be Hager's fat pad. And then here in B on the far um, left side of the screen, you'll see a short axis view. Um, and you can see that regular appearance of um, the short axis of the tendon um, looks fibrillar like a, and uh, pretty hyperechoic. Now that's in contrast to what I saw when I put the ultrasound on this patient. So he's laying prone, and this is a long axis view of his Achilles. And so left side of the screen is gonna be the more proximal scans. And then I moved a little bit further distally on the right side. And you can see a loss of regular fiber appearance and continuity. Um, there's a hypoechoic region at the mid substance, which is suggestive of edema. Um, and then you can actually see in the more distal aspect, there still is a regular appearing tendon that is inserting onto the calcaneus. And then when you switch to short axis, which is going to be B um, view here at the top right, um, you can see um, scanning from proximal to distal. And you can see that this um, short axis of the tendon looks irregular. Um, there is edema surrounding it, which is the anechoic fluid surrounding the structure and just loss of the normal fiber continuity and just lack of fibers altogether. So for Achilles tendon ruptures, um, there will be a complete tendon fiber disruption and tendon retraction. Uh, the torn tendon ends are hypoechoic usually with the proximal stump being tapered and then the distal stump um, displacing anteriorly towards the caker's fat pad. And you can see that demonstrated here in the far left in A. Um, the torn tendon gap can sometimes fill in with a little bit of um, fluid or hemorrhage. Um, and then here in short axis, you can see that demonstrated as well. Um, with a suspected full thickness Achilles tear, it's important to use dynamic imaging to ensure that it's an accurate diagnosis. So while you have them in the prone position, you can do passive ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, and you can actually see the tendon retraction at the tear become more obvious. Um, and then 
it, this is also important in the setting of a subacute or chronic tendon tear because the hemorrhage and scar can sometimes um, simulate tendon fibers and sometimes partial healing can actually be present. And so that, that's why even though Thompson's test is often um, really helpful, sometimes you can miss things, especially if you're in um, a less acute situation. And then um, it also is in, uh, one important pitfall in the setting of a full thickness Achilles tendon tear is the presence of an intact plantaris tendon at the medial aspect of the Achilles tendon. And that can actually simulate intact Achilles tendon fibers, and that's demonstrated here in C. Um, the plantaris tendon is usually intact in the setting of a full thickness Achilles tear, um, and so that could be um, related to the fact that the plantaris is a stronger tendon compared to the Achilles. So instead of calling that a partial um, thickness Achilles tear, uh, it's a full thickness Achilles tear with an intact plantaris. And then here we have demonstrated two other pathologies which are similar. So on the left side, you have the Achilles partial thickness tear. You're gonna see the hypoechoic or anechoic area or cleft within the tendon that partially disrupts the tendon fibers, but not completely. So you still have intact tendon fibers around that area of defect, um, both in the long and the short axis views. And then Achilles tendinopathy, that's something that we do see commonly in our clinics, maybe less so um, in the ED, but it's just important to be aware of. It often is a predisposing um, risk factor for Achilles tendon rupture. And so what that's going to appear as is um, hypertrophy of the tendon, which you can see really well here um, in the long axis view. And then it's going to um, be more hypoechoic than the um, than the normal tendon. And then that's um, in that's indicating some of the microscopic tears that are the pathophysiology of tendinopathy. You are not gonna see fiber disruption, however, on a macroscopic level. And then here in the short axis view, this demonstrates, ooh, sorry, um, here in the short axis view, um, you can see that there's increased flow with the Doppler and that's indicative of neovascularity, which is also part of the pathophysiology of tendinopathy. And so, you know, the initial management from your standpoint is going to be elevation, pain control, non-weight bearing with crutches, and then functional bracing with the foot and plantar flexion, and that should really be initiated within 48 hours of injury. The debate right now is whether we send these to surgery or if we manage these conservatively. And traditionally, the surgical treatment was favored due to the lower rates of re-rupture. However, there is a growing body of evidence suggesting that surgery doesn't actually lead to better long-term functional outcomes than non-operative management. And there is then the risk of um, complications such as infection. Um, so, you know, the non-operative management is going to look like immobilization with a cast or cam boot and plantar flexion using some heel wedges for about six to 12 weeks. There's different protocols um, out there. And then gradually you're going to reduce those wedges, usually one to two weeks at a time to return the foot gradually to um, a neutral position. Usually you can start weight bearing um, in the can boot um, around six to eight weeks. And then they're gonna be doing you know, a bunch of PT. The operative management is gonna be uh, an Achilles repair. Um, like I said, there is some consideration that this may lead to a faster return to sport time, though now they are, the jury is kind of out on that. Um, there is evidence that it is a lower risk of re-rupture. And so for people that are doing more ballistic sports, um, it or doing um, high intensive labor jobs, it may be beneficial to, you know, do a surgical um, management of these patients. But really these need to be seen as soon as possible, either in our clinics or in our surgical colleagues clinics, um, because the operative management should be done ideally within two weeks. And like I said, the considerations for these management uh, kind of um, options are gonna be age, activity level, and their comorbidities. So for instance, the patient in this case, he is a type one diabetic with an A1C of nine. So we ended up managing him non-operatively, even though he is someone who does, you know, uh, recreational, how, you know, albeit, but sport activity that is ballistic in nature. So, you know, this is an example of how ultrasound is ideally suited for tendon injury evaluation. And that's actually something that has been demonstrated in the literature as well. Um, it's been shown to have a 100% sensitivity, 83% specificity, and 92% accuracy for distinguishing between the partial and the full thickness Achilles tendon tears, um, with the surgical findings being the gold standard in that study. Um, it, like 
we have been kind of reiterating, it reduces costs and delay associated with advanced imaging um, and allows for, you know, expediting management of these issues. So the clinical implications of this are, you know, that being able to make these diagnoses promptly allows for the accurate discussions regarding management options. And, you know, like we were just talking about, partial tears are usually going to be managed non-operatively, whereas the complete tears should have the urgent evaluations in order to discuss, you know, whether we are going to do surgery or, you know, non-op them. And that's something that, you know, is a decision point that can make a big difference with, um, you know, what their options actually are. Because if we do have a delay, then you can get increased scarring and ultimately, you know, then operative care is going to be not a viable option. Um, and in certain patients that could potentially lead to a poor functional outcome. So in summary, um, musculoskeletal ultrasound is a tool that can add to your practice. Um, I, you know, I, as well as my colleagues, use it as an extension of our physical exam. Not only does it aid in the diagnosis, but it really has the ability to expedite care um, and appropriate care. Um, it does improve patient satisfaction. It is really challenging. It's something that I'm still working on getting better at, um, and it takes time to even, you know, start to understand what you're looking at. Um, but, you know, with that, I encourage you to, you know, use it, right? It doesn't take a whole lot of time to get the ultrasound out, you know, put it on the patient's skin and take a look, right? And it doesn't have, you know, any real downside to it. And so I encourage you to, you know, just keep practicing at it. So that way, you know, you gradually, you know, get your chops up and then stop, you know, acting like you're in, uh, what is it, black box, bird box, or something like that, where you have no idea what you're looking at, and then start looking more like this sonography stock photo where she's very happy and um, seems very uh, comfortable with the ultrasound probe in her hand. So um, there's a few resources out there. Um, these uh, are available online. The um, European Society of Musculoskeletal Radiology, they have guidelines. So if you just Google ESSR guidelines, and then they have one for every single body part, that was kind of what I started looking at in residency, and I found it quite helpful. Um, it's pretty succinct. It has good um, references as far as like the orientation of the probe and then what you're looking at from a diagnostic standpoint. Um, the Jacobson book is what I use a lot. Um, it can be a little bit hard to follow, but it does, you know, Jacobson is kind of one of the grandfathers of musculoskeletal ultrasound in the States. And um, I find it to be, you know, something I keep going back to. And then there are case series on YouTube um, developed by um, American Medical Society of Sports Medicine um, physicians, and those are free. So, um, you know, these are all good things to just, you know, keep learning um, uh, with. And then here are references. And then does anybody have any questions? Oh, well, thank you guys. That was a spectacular uh, overview of musculoskeletal ultrasound for uh, for emergency medicine providers and those who uh, who operate at the front lines. So I think that was uh, that was really really good. And I, I really appreciated the fact that you uh, provided some resources at the end where we can dig in further because uh, I know this audience, both online as well as or here now, and the ones that are going to be seeing this later on the YouTube channel, we'll definitely want to dig in and look at some of those. So thank you for, for providing those as well. Um, no 